another example, uh, as I was uh, uh, teaching, uh, we're working with um, volumes dealing with the theology of the Old Testament, and I remember one famous uh, uh, author who was uh, very uh, highly respected in Old Testament theology. He had written two volume uh, on the theology of the Old Testament, and in this two volume uh, of uh, theology of the Old Testament, there was only one short paragraph on forgiveness. Because uh, he said, there is really no forgiveness in the Old Testament. He saw God only as punishing you if you don't obey. But they forgot that in the formula, uh, in the formula in the sanctuary, it says, uh, and the priest shall make atonement for uh, the sinner, uh, and he shall be forgiven. And that word that is being used in those formulas about forgiven uh, or forgiveness is a word that is never used about human beings. It is always used about God. But whenever uh, the sacrifices are brought in the sanctuary, uh, this formula uh, was uh, made active, which says God forgives. But the scholars couldn't see that. Then we come, when we come to uh, Jesus here on earth, in Luke chapter 15, uh, we find uh, one uh, of Christ's ways to correct that image of the Father. And notice, uh, as we, uh, we are famili very familiar with those stories that are in chapter 15 in Luke, and we'll look at that closer. But often we forget to read the introductory um, note. In the first two verses in chapter 15, it says, now all the tax gatherers and the sinners were coming near him, that's to say near Jesus, to listen to him. And both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them which uh, was completely contrary to their uh, concept of God. God would never do that. He would only associate with holy beings. So Jesus tells them uh, uh, three uh, parables. One about the lost sheep, another about the lost coin, and then a third one about a lost son. But notice that all three of them have to do with a financial loss. Notice in the first one, uh, there is a sheep that had inadvertently strayed from the flock. And the owner becomes desperate and keeps looking for it until it's found. Why was he looking for it? Because it had a financial value for him. And then when he finds it, there is a great celebration. But notice how Jesus comments on that. He says, um, uh, he's not criticizing them for rejoicing in finding it, but he says, um, uh, I'll tell you, there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. They were uh, joyful that they found a sheep. But Jesus was joyful uh, that he had found some sinners. Similar, we find uh, in the next uh, story, the coin, which was the equivalent of one day's salary, had got lost uh, through uh, probably some carelessness. So the owner begins to clean the house and continues to clean it until he finds it. And when he finds that coin, then there is again a great celebration. But not uh, over finding the coin. But notice again what Jesus says. I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents 
They celebrated over a found coin, but notice they became uh, the grumbling that this, uh, Jesus had found some sinners. And that's what Jesus is referring to. And then comes the, uh, actually the, the longest uh, story. You see, uh, those two that I've told, uh, looked at, the Pharisees could easily identify with. They recognized that this would be, be their reaction. But Jesus points out that heaven would celebrate even more if one uh, lost soul returns to God. And the last story or parable deals with a human being in a family where the younger son makes a conscious decision to leave home and goes to a distant country. Again, there is a celebration, but the older uh, faithful brother who stayed home, he became angry and rejected to celebrate or participate in the celebration of him being found. Again, um, uh, they all three are dealing with the same issue. We relate these stories usually to, to Jesus, and there's nothing wrong with that. But there's more to it than that. Uh, Jesus is uh, rebuking uh, the people for having the wrong attitude. They celebrate uh, mostly uh, finding some financial value, but when it has to do with persons, they don't care. And also, usually we think of the last story as being about a desperate son who decides to go back when he has squandered all his wealth. And this is why in most cases we refer to this as the story of the prodigal son. But when you read it carefully, that's not the primary emphasis of the story. Careful reading shows that it's rather about the father who is mentioned 10 times in the story and his attitude toward his two sons. The story is quite familiar, but it has some unexpected in terms of events. You remember the story, but let's just review it a little bit. Two boys, the younger demanding his share of the property, then leaving home uh, and squandering all his possessions, then living in poverty for a while before deciding to return home, where his father rewards him with a cel uh, celebration. The older son stays home, serving his father faithfully for years, then complains about the father's reception of the wayward son and about not being rewarded for his faithfulness all those years. In our world, in our thinking, we would have expected the father to reward the older son who stayed home, reward him for his faithfulness. And so did the Pharisees to whom Jesus was speaking. And once there was a pastor who retold this, uh, this story from that perspective that God was celebrating and with the older son, thanking him for his faithfulness. And then someone in the audience exclaimed, yes, that's the way the story should end. But the problem is it doesn't. And the story has many surprises. Let's look at some details. At the beginning, the younger son approaches his father and makes his request for his share of the estate. We might rightly have expected the father to react by something like, why? You must be joking. You can't be serious. Have you lost your mind? Or at least use uh, his authority to try to stop him. But this father is different. He is not distant or unapproachable. He is ready to listen to the son requesting his share of the estate. 
This meant one-third of everything the father owned because there were two sons, and the older one would get two-thirds, and the younger one would get uh, the remaining one-third. And the text tells us that the father, in the beginning, he divided his wealth between them. Notice it doesn't say he just picked out the one-third and gave it to his younger son. He divided it um, between them. So the older son got his share, had his two-thirds already there. But notice what the father did. He did not oppose his son. Neither did he criticize or judge him. And actually, he accepted him and allowed him to express his wishes and make his own choices, even though he knew they would hurt him and his family. Instead of being harsh and demanding and using his authority and rights as father and leader of his household, he respected his father's, uh, his, pardon me, he respected his son's wishes even though he realized that it meant that he might be ridiculed by the community. His reputation and respect in the community would be destroyed. Why could he not do something about his son? He appeared as a weak father. But actually, there was nothing wrong with the son's request. It was perfectly legal uh, at the time to divide uh, the estate while the father was still alive, but to use it while the father uh, lived implied that the son wished his father was uh, already dead. And the younger son uh, didn't seem to care. He used it all. Another major surprise comes in the middle of the story as the son returns home, broke, filthy, and in tattered clothes, having lived among the lowest of the low. Nothing was more humiliating for any respectable Jew than working with and living among pigs. They were classified as so unclean you couldn't have any association with them. But this son is met by his father. What kind of reception would you have expected if you were this son? How would your father have reacted? How would you react as a parent if your child was like this? An extraordinary good father might accept him, but would very likely require him to clean up and then meet with him to discuss the problem and work out some appropriate action to ensure that the son would at least learn his lesson. I think most of us would identify with that kind of an attitude. <laughs> but listen, for instance, uh, to the following description of God's reaction to Adam's uh, disobedience according to a Jewish and Christian writing from the, about the third or fourth century. It says, God said to him, Shadrach, who was uh, the recipient of this talk, uh, be it known to thee that I, uh, uh, God is talking, that I ordered all things to be placable uh, to uh, Adam. I gave him understanding, I made him heir of heaven and earth and that subjected all things to him, and every living thing flees from him and from before his face. But uh, having uh, received of mine, he became an alien, adulterous and sinful. Tell me what father, having given his son his portion, when he takes his substance and leaves his father and goes away and becomes an alien and serves an alien, when the father sees that the son deserted him, does he, uh, doesn't, he, uh, doesn't it darken his heart? And, does it not, and doesn't the father go and take his substance and banish him from uh, the, his glory because uh, he deserted his father? And how have I, the wonderful and jealous God, given him everything 
And he, having received these things, has become an adulterer and a sinner. This is from, a, a, from the third or fourth century. Uh, and uh, uh, so you can see the people at that time had similar attitudes as we have. And they apply that uh, uh, attitude toward God. But notice, this father is different. Notice, he ran toward his son. Why? To pour out his scorn on him for, what, uh, uh, for the bad reputation he had brought on the family? Or to tell him, look at you, how could you do this? Or to tell him not to let anyone see him come home in this condition? Or tell him not to come close to the house and defile everyone in it? No, it says, he embraced his son in his bad-smelling clothes, filth and everything. And then, when the son begins to confess his wrongdoings, the father appears not uh, to be even listening. He is too busy giving orders to his servants to prepare a party. For the father, it was enough that the son was back. In the Old Testament, the same word is used about returning and repenting. The difference is only a matter of interpretation or translation. To repent is to return to the place where you came from. And ultimately, everyone has come from God. Therefore, real repentance is about returning to God. So the fact that the son was back was his repentance. No words could add to that fact. The father was not interested to know all the details about the things that the son had done. All he was interested in was the fact that his son was back. But wait a minute. What was it that drove the son home? Was his repentance uh, genuine or false? We often say that repentance is true only if the individual is sorry for the wrong that he has done, but false if he is just sorry for himself. And we often, uh, I have often heard this, and I'm sure I have uh, used that too. If you're just uh, sorry because you're afraid of the consequences, that's not really repentance. Repentance uh, means that you are sorry for uh, what you really did, irrespective of the consequences. And the question is, which was it in this case? What was it that drove him home? Was it uh, his uh, concept of his uh, wrongdoing? No, it says he was hungry. His stomach was hurting from ha hunger, and he had been badly treated. And he realized, uh, at least home, I got something to eat. And even the servants and the slaves, they get plenty to eat. So I better go home. But what can I say? Yeah, I'm sorry for uh, all that I did. Let me at least become your, uh, become your servant. But the father didn't really care why his son came back. The important thing was that he was back. And what a reception he got, including several surprises. We have already mentioned the father ran to meet his son. In that culture, especially at that time, it was very undignified for an older person and a leader in the community to run. And I remember I read um, that apparently a few years ago, a pastor in that area was approached by one of his elders who timidly, but in no uncertain terms, told the pastor the congregation could no longer have respect for him as pastor. When the pastor inquired into the reason, the elder told him that someone had seen the pastor walk rapidly down the road. That was considered undignified. But the father couldn't care less. His son was coming back. Next, 
He embraced his son. That was not appropriate under the circumstances. How could he show such open acceptance of such a rebel and a loser? And a lot of us have that kind of an attitude. We have to show uh, our, uh, that we are not uh, too happy with the individual as they are. I remember when I was uh, working in a boarding school. I happened to be the principal at the time. And there was one student who was, uh, uh, had been uh, quite disobedient. And um, uh, he was due for uh, some punishment. But I remember I talked to uh, that individual and uh, advised the student to withdraw from the school due to the disciplinary problems. When I shared that with the, the dean of man, this is a boarding school, uh, he didn't like it. He said, we should have punished him first. And the, so, uh, but uh, the student uh, went home and uh, did not have the bad stamp on himself that uh, he had been kicked out of the school. But we, uh, we had wanted him to feel that he had been out, an outcast. But that's a similar experience that we had been talking about here, about the, uh, uh, the son. Then we find that the father, he kissed him thereby openly acknowledging him as his son. He could have been a little more discreet about it, but this father didn't care. This was his long lost son and he was coming back. And then he gave him the best robe in the house. In rich homes, a special robe was kept for special occasion. Uh, when someone came for a visit whom they wanted uh, to show a special honor. This time the honored guest was the returned son. The father also gave him shoes or sandals, which was a symbol of uh, a free person. Slaves and servants did not wear shoes. They walked barefoot. The father gave his sons uh, a sandal. The son wanted to appeal to his father to accept him as one of his servants, but before he could do so, uh, you see, uh, the, uh, if you read the story, you uh, read that the son had prepared a speech that he wanted to say to his father. He said, I have sinned against you uh, and against the, the family. I have sinned against the heaven and, the, uh, and in your side and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But then he had also planned to say, make me as one of your hired men. But he never got to say the last uh, phrase to his father. Because you get the, uh, as I mentioned, you get the impression that the father didn't even listen. He was too busy telling his servants, prepare a feast. Then we read also he placed a ring on his finger or on his hand. This was not just uh, seen as a piece of jewelry or an expensive gift. This ring was a symbol of authority and the prestige. Um, uh, <clears throat> and rings frequently served as seals for documents. So it was actually the equivalent of being given the authority to sign all the checks for the family. And he had just squandered all of his uh, share already. What a father. Would your father do that? Would you do that to your children? From now on, you can sign, uh, 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 Sign all the checks for the family. You become responsible. Then the father had his servants uh, prepare the fatted calf. Similar to the best robe, it was reserved for special occasions when you wanted to honor a guest. This time it was the son who was back home. And then finally, 
the father booked the best band uh, in town to provide music for dancing and celebration for the whole family, including uh, the father himself. The past was forgotten. The son had been, de uh, had been dead, but now he had come alive. And we uh, read in the Gospel of John how uh, Jesus himself defined death. In John chapter 5, uh, 24, it points out uh, that um, uh, it says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. So life apart from Christ, Christ classified as death. If you accept Christ, you are alive. So in that sense, the son had been dead. Today was a new day, a new beginning. But you say, what does all this have to do with forgiveness? Nowhere in the story is forgiveness even mentioned. Does it mean that the father never forgave his son? And if he forgave him, we are not told when that took place. Some might say that it came when the son confessed to his father. But when we look at the text, it appears that the father doesn't even seem to be even listening at the time. He is too busy giving orders to his servants to prepare a feast. Also, the son never completes his prepared speech. And why did the father run to meet his son even before he had heard anything of what the son had wanted to say? Also, what does it imply that the father saw him while he was still far off? Was it a coincidence? Or was the father perhaps looking for him hoping and waiting. Would he have done that if he had not forgiven his son? And that was before the son had returned or repented. Actually, the story indicates that the father forgave his son as he gave him the money uh, in the beginning, even before the son had used a penny of it uh, for either good or bad. This is why he didn't need to listen to his son's wicked escapades when he came back. What was important was that the son was back to receive the forgiveness which had been waiting for him all the time. And perhaps the greatest surprise of the story is that the father represents God. And the surprising picture God and Jesus is painting of his father is that God is approachable understanding, respected of individual freedom, loving, caring, forgiving, in the real biblical sense. And he does not wait until we repent to forgive us. And the key message of the story is that God has already forgiven us. Our repentance and return to God is our response, our way of saying, thank you, God, that you have accepted and forgiven me. And we read that um, in First John chapter 2, that Jesus is the propitiation or the forgiveness of the sins of the whole world. And that was even 2,000 years before you or I uh, entered the picture. And, um, <clears throat> and this is why he says, uh, God forgave uh, the world. He committed himself to the consequences of human wrongful decisions and uh, not hold them against him. That's why he says, return to me, for I have redeemed you. Notice it does not say, I will, forget the, uh, I will redeem you. He says, I have redeemed you. It is like uh, in a bank. You may owe, uh, many of us owe uh, money to the bank or some institution. But let's imagine a rich individual uh, comes and says, uh, and deposits unlimited amount of money to that bank and says, this is to pay for the debts of everyone who owes anything to this institution. There's only one condition. The individual has to come and apply for it. 
If you heard this on the radio to, uh, today, what would you uh, do when the bank opened on Monday? But I know there are a lot of people who would say, oh, this is a scam. But this wasn't a scam. This is uh, really what it's all about. God has forgiven. He has redeemed. But we have to come to God and say, thank you, God. I'm going to accept it. That's repentance. And when we do, um, we read in the Bible in Zephaniah that God sings. And there's the only text that I'm aware of in the whole Bible that speaks about God singing. And that is in the context uh, of uh, individuals accepting the positive judgment he is going to make. He sings and rejoices. And, uh, um, and this is the essence of salvation. God's love for fallen humanity and his joy upon their return to him. And he rewards them, the rebels of the universe, who uh, have returned by seating them, as you read in Revelation chapter uh, 2, uh, no, Revelation chapter 3. Uh, and he seats those uh, previous rebels at his side and making them the co-rulers of the unfallen universe. That's what the story is about. And the, uh, now the, uh, the singing team is going to come up and sing uh, to us, uh, with us, uh, about the uh, blessedness that is, uh, uh, God is calling us, please come back, please come back, I'm waiting for you. Uh, and that's uh, all we look for. Uh, God is full of surprises. Amen. Let's stand as we think and sing these words. Think about what the message is. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you.
glad to listen to your voice and that you are calling us back. We have wandered far away from you. We may have wasted many precious years of our lives and, and we have become tired of sin and, st and straying and we would like to come back. Uh, and we trust your love, so we would like to uh, come home. Help us to learn from the experience uh, of the uh, lost son, that he experienced the love of his father. Help us uh, to uh, believe that and return to you. No matter how badly we have wandered off, you are ready to accept us. And you are ready to clean us and uh, make us special guests and giving, uh, give us a special place in your kingdom. Help us uh, to accept that, uh, not only me mentally, but also in our experience. Bless each and every one uh, of us here today as we go back home and we begin uh, to uh, live uh, the life that you want us to uh, do. Uh, and there, uh, thereby witnessing about your love for us. Because God has also that love for everybody else. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you. Amen. Amen. Amen.